welcome uh, to this session, which I hope you'll find to be practical and informative about um, all about rights and helping you to make sure that your rights are in order. Um, we're going to start by explaining why it's so important and then go on to some practical solutions. Um, and we're going to be, um, the format will change during the course of the session, so you won't um, have to look at this podium for the entire session. Um, I'm delighted to have two very experienced panellists today. Um, we've got um, Claire Hodder on my immediate, um, first on the, the platform, who has an immense amount of experience in rights management and licensing, um, over 18 years of it, latterly at um, Palgrave Macmillan, and she's been doing a lot of work with PLS around rights um, over the last year and a half or two, which has been invaluable, and she's able to share her experiences uh, with the industry in that way. And then um, to her left, your right of Claire, is um, Natalina um, Bertoli, who um, is very experienced, does a lot of work around mergers and ac acquisitions, advising on partnerships and strategic alliances, and you'll find out why she thinks rights are also incredibly important in her field of work. Um, so um, we do want to, there will be some opportunities for you to um, participate and share some of your thoughts on what we're talking about uh, at a couple of points in the session. But before we launch in, could I just see through a show of hands how many of you are currently involved in rights management, directly involved on a sort of day-to-day -day basis? Sorry, can I see hands? Okay, it looks like about 50% of you. And um, how many of you have run into problems around rights, or is it all plain sailing? <laughs> yes, <laughs> few problems. <laughs> okay. <laughs> And those of you who aren't handling rights on a day-to-day -day basis, presumably um, you're here because you feel that you want to know more or um, that you ought to be doing it or that someone in your company ought to be doing it. Yeah. Good. Excellent. Um, so you might ask, well, why is PLS getting involved in all of this? And um, it's for a number of reasons. I mean, copyright is at the heart of the business of PLS. It's what enables us to, ma to monetize uh, the copying of your titles um, through licensing your rights. And um, through that licensing to, to generate revenue, which we can then pay out to publishers. Now, without copyright, we would have no basis on which to charge and, and pay out to all of you. And bearing in mind that last year, PLS paid out £35 million to publishers. It's a not uninteresting sum of money, which goes straight to the bottom of line of publishers. So, in fact, it's worth quite a bit more than that. Um, but another reason, last year we, we had a, what we call a valuation of rights, um, where we, together with the um, authors group, ALCS and the visual artists organizations, we commissioned an independent valuer to assess how the l revenue from collective licensing should be split between publishers, authors, and visual artists. And um, we were very keen that that should be an evidence-based split. It should follow, the money should follow the rights. So we needed, of course, to establish where the rights lay. And the valuation process really shone a light on the status of publishers' rights ownership. And we came away feeling there was some room for improvement, shall we say. Because um, what came through will, has had a direct bearing on the eventual split that the um, valuer decided on. Um, so we'll, we'll come on to that a bit later. But it, it really reminded us all that it's so important to have your rights in good order. And um, we've also launched, as you know, a, 
I'm sure, a, a clearance service, PLS Clear, a permissions clearance service, and this was on the back of um, some work on text and data mining, and uh, researchers saying they didn't know where to find all these publishers to get permission, and we said, well, come to PLS, because we do know where they are. And so that was the beginning of a, a, a permissions clearance service that is now really taking off. So we're, we're drawn into this area more and more, and we, we feel, as an industry body, we have a responsibility, and, and we're in a good position to, to provide support to publishers to try and get things into, into really good shape. Um, and it's why we're, we are investing in this area. So um, rights are very important. It's important they, they come with obligations. My view is the obligation is to use them, to enforce them, um, so that you make the most of them. Otherwise, you run the risk of, of losing them. So um, let's go on to some slides. Um, we're going to look at seven key risks that we've identified, um, and then seven ways to um, handle that and seven solutions. So what do we really mean by rights management? For our purposes, we're really looking at things at the beginning, at the beginning of the line. It's all about how you acquire the rights that you need. It's rights acquisition. We're not going into how you then exploit them, how you then sell them, how you license them. This is all about how you take in those rights and what you do when you've got them, how you manage them, and um, make sure that you keep things up to date so that you're not eroding them in any way and losing them. So um, it's important when you're acquiring rights to remember that um, there could be several different copyrights involved because our law um, does recognize rights in all the different elements, for example, in a journal. Um, so, and, and a monograph. I mean, you've got the copyright in the text. You may then have images, whether they're photographs or drawings. You may have charts and tables. Um, there may be an audiovisual element, and that's coming in more and more. Some of those elements may have been created um, in-house, some of them may have been created by third parties with whom you have contracts. You need to make sure that you've documented and looked at every aspect of your product and made sure, make sure you cover every copyright base. Um, and I think it's, you also, when you're acquiring rights, need to think about what you're going to do with them further down the line. So you want to acquire as much as you possibly can to cover all the likely business um, plans that you have. So there's a lot involved in this, and um, I hope that by the end of the session you'll see just why it is so important. And we hope to help you through it. So with that, I'm going to hand over to Claire to kickstart this. Thank you, Sarah. Hi, everyone. Um, can I just ask for a quick show of hands to see if there's anyone in the room who's not a publisher? A few. And um, for those who aren't, pub for those who are publishers, is there anyone here who is not responsible for acquiring rights in an editorial capacity? Yeah, a couple. <laughs> Okay, well, I just wanted to um, raise that because you can assume that rights acquisition, rights management is just something that's the responsibility of an editorial department. But actually, publishers and non-publishers alike, we are all putting content out there and rights management applies to you all equally. So please don't think it's something specific just for editors. Um, so as Sarah said, we've identified uh, seven risks that um, we, we think uh, are important to, to talk about and get people thinking about. So I'm just going to start off with risk one, 
which is uh, an important one. Nobody wants to lose money, so we'll start with that. Um, we think there are several areas where not having good rights management, not putting your rights in order, can directly impact your bottom line, and we've got a couple of examples here. First one I want to talk about is in terms of archives and backlists. So um, for those of you who are publishers, you might have already begun a programme of digitising um, your backlist content or even have it available out there. Uh, and for those that have done that, you'll be aware of the myriad of rights issues that arise from trying to undertake that kind of project. Um, you might have content that you've been assigned rights for, um, which is not generally problematic, but anything that you've published under some kind of licence or you've had to um, obtain permission to include in content that you're looking at gets much more complicated. Licence agreements differ in the terms that they offer. They might have restrictions over certain formats. They might give uh, license. They might only licence you rights for a specific period of time. They might say that you have to go back to them to get consent to do X, Y, and Z. Um, they might have complicated royalty provisions that you've got to work out, or they might be completely unclear as to the rights you do or don't have at all. Um, and all of that sort of wrangling with rights issues from licences and agreements is, of course, only relevant if you've been able to locate the actual agreements in the first place, which is often easier said than done. And now, most of those issues can be solved, but it's time-consuming and expensive, and you need to resource a, a research and data collection exercise in order to just establish you know, what kind of backlist you've got, what, what is it you can commercially exploit. Um, you might have to write to lots of authors, you might have to re-clear permissions, um, or you might have to just remove content that you don't have rights for from your digitised version. Um, so inevitably there will be some content you just end up not being able to make available at all. But if you can get on top of these rights issues, um, it will enable you to open up your content archive to a whole new generation of scholars and to obviously benefit from the resulting sales income. And once your archive content is out there, um, it's also likely to bring in additional revenue from collective licensing and from transactional licensing as people want to reuse it. Uh, another area where, where your bottom line is directly affected is in terms of subsidiary rights opportunities. Most publishers have people in their organisations who are responsible for licensing rights to the content that you uh, produce. Uh, and these staff could be bringing the business much more revenue if they had access to really good rights records. If you talk to any rights salesperson, they'll be able to give you examples of rights deals they've had to turn down because the contractual paper trail went cold and they couldn't confirm that the business had the necessary rights to make the deal. Um, I did some work for someone who uh, published a historic literature series with beautiful covers. The company was approached by a manufacturer of iPad cases who wished to use those cover designs uh, on iPad cases that they were going to produce in the hundreds of thousands. Um, the publishing company and the designer had worked together to come up with the designs um, for these covers, but the paperwork between them was unclear as to where the rights lay, and in addition there were agreements with image libraries for some of the covers, which were in the name of the designer and not the publisher. The designer was approached, but unwilling to sign a new agreement to enable the deal to go ahead, and so that was the opportunity lost, and uh, the world has a much poorer choice of iPad covers as a result. <laughs> and there are all sorts of examples like that. Um, and it just as sort of almost plucking a figure out of thin air, but I, I would sort of be reasonably confident that about 10% of permissions requests probably don't progress because people are unable to ascertain the, the rights or progress with that uncertainty. Um, and when you consider that in most businesses, subsidiary rights income goes straight to the bottom line as profit, um, in Lynette Owen's book, Selling Rights, she says, you need to multiply the value of a rights deal by at least eight times in order to make an accurate comparison with revenue bought in from other sales sources. So missed sub-licensing opportunities can really have a, an impact on profit. Uh, and the third area uh, in which we think that... Um, poor rights management can impact your bottom line is uh, in terms of missed collective licensing opportunities. So I'll hand you back to Sarah to talk about that. Sorry, am I switched on? Yeah. This goes back to the valuation that I mentioned earlier. And um, we've moved now from a world where we used to have a negotiated split between publishers, authors, and visual artists to this um, evidence-based split. 
So it is really crucial that um, publishers' rights are um, properly lined up. The, in the case of journals, the outcome from the valuation last year, and this was based on the contracts that, we, that were looked at by the valuer, um, he did a, a random sample. So publishers have ended up with 76% of the revenue with 23% <coughs> going to authors and 1% going to the visual artists. Now, we, we think, talking to publishers, that the split for publishers should actually be much higher than 76%. So next time we review this, which will be in 2019, we're hoping that the samples <coughs> that come forward will show um, tighter rights ownership in favour of publishers. So there's something for you to work with and you might get a bigger share of collective licensing revenues going forward if we're able to do that. So there's a really hard deadline to work towards. Admittedly, with collective licensing, you know, the samples go back sometimes decades because people are copying um, quite old publications, but, um, and you may not be able to do much about the past, but going forward, if we could get into this good practice of getting acquiring the rights, that would be really helpful. Ian? Well, we like to ask questions. Why not? So, when I started my career in publishing, um, our operations director was very hot on making sure that copyright assignment forms were all filed and recorded and everybody knew where they were and there was very tight rights management. And actually, in the era of an agreed split, uh, in that organisation, that became of less importance. And I think that happened in a number of other organisations as well. And now we have, as you say, that historic um, issue to, to deal with. But it, 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 are there specific things and specific support that PLS can be giving to publishers, whether it's information or tools, that will help the specific sorts of rights management that will help um, provide a, a, I was going to say a more equitable split, but a, a split that we feel is, is supported in the, in the next uh, valuation exercise? Yeah, we, we will, may not surprise you, be coming on to that close to the end of the session. We, we've got some ideas, so we will be there to support publishers, indeed. So, <laughs> so on to risk two, stifling innovation. So we feel that not having a comprehensive set of rights that covers the range of uses you might want to wish to make of your content can really start to hamper your ambitions. You might want to experiment with different kinds of publishing, creating apps, developing multimedia content, blogs, blogs, um, use content within social media, build events around your content and come up with many other innovative new ways to engage with the scholarly community. But in order to embark on these kinds of projects, you need to know that you've got the right rights. If you don't have comprehensive, easily accessible rights information for your content, this can be really time consuming. An appraisal of the time and resource required to simply carry out the research, let alone deal with putting any new agreements in place, can be so daunting and add so much additional cost that the risk might outweigh the reward and the next big thing gets shelved before anyone's even had a chance to, to develop it. Um, in my previous role, I was very much seen as the party pooper. <laughs> ah. <laughs> um, so I'd have lots of really buzzy, exciting, creative salespeople coming into my office to tell me about their great idea. And they would always end with, so just running it by you to make sure that there's not going to be any rights issues with that. OK, and sort of try to get out of the door before I said, uh, hang on a minute. Because <laughs> um, uh, there was always a rights issue of some kind. Um, luckily, uh, we did have really good rights records, so it was relatively straightforward to identify what those issues might be. And on the whole, projects could usually go ahead in some form or other, but perhaps with different content than had ori been originally envisaged or tweaks to the functionality or the sales model. Um, and even then, some ideas just had to be parked. So without good records, the time taken just to evaluate the situation um, would probably result in you know, just missing opportunities. 
Um, and I think it's worth saying something about third party material at this point um, and the impact that can have on an ability to publish. So many publishers, as Ian said, work hard on ensuring they have really rigorous and all-encompassing head contracts, they get full copyright assignments and they file those all away diligently. But if you don't apply the same level of care to the agreements that you get for the other bits of content that make up your publications, you might find yourselves in a bit of a hole. Um, I've seen lots of cases where not getting sufficient rights for third party content can prevent a publication being made available digitally um, and it can curtail the expected life of a print publication. So if you've got an academic monograph which five years after publication is selling two to three copies a year in uh, ebook version and print on demand, it contains a few tables for which the permission agreement you sought to include them has expired. So what are you going to do? Are you going to edit the, your production files, blank out that content, resend it to the POD supplier, swap out the ebook uh, on your platform, uh, or are you just going to put the book out of print? Um, either way, you've got um, content which is either unavailable or significantly compromised. Um, and I know there are issues at the moment with publishers disagreeing over terms relating to reuse of articles and chapters in edited collections. And it's got to the point where in some disciplines, publishing edited collections is just not viable. So being aware of the limitations that might arise from the use of third party content and putting in place strategies to manage those when you're planning new products and services is really a critical component of good rights management. Okay harder to combat piracy. So for this section, um, I'm going to pass on some information from Emma House, who many of you will know, Director of Publisher Relations at the Publishers Association, and Claire Anker, also from the Publishers Association, who is the Digital Infringement Manager there. Um, and they have first-hand experience of fighting against piracy and enforcing our rights. But that task is made immeasurably more difficult if the publishers whose rights they're trying to defend don't have good rights management processes. So Emma says, copyright is a lot more complicated than patents and trademarks because there's no registration. So proving ownership, which is essential if you want to enforce your rights, can be tricky. In many overseas countries, you need to go beyond ownership of rights. It starts with demonstrating that you're a company. And in China, they add a company of good standing. So that means registered at company's house with certificates, etc. Um, which is all generally straightforward, unless you're a company with a variety of imprints. Enforcing rights across a company that's been through mergers and acquisitions or has set up multiple imprints all requires paperwork to prove that you own that, those companies. In order to take action, it's often necessary to assign power of attorney to uh, a local overseas office or a distributor, and in turn, a local lawyer. And the power of attorney has got to be in the same name as the company registration and match the company uh, ownership paperwork. And then it comes down to demonstrating rights ownership, usually uh, via an author-publisher agreement, an assignment or a licence, which isn't so bad if you've got a book by a single author. But for a journal, that means every agreement between each author and the publisher that covering all the articles um, in that issue needs to be uh, produced. And the paperwork must match. So the copyright notice in the front of the book or journal must match the author-publisher agree uh, agreement uh, and that must tie into the company registration document and the power of attorney. So everything has to um, be in order. Uh, and as Emma says, it sounds simple, but it never is. In practice, it's very hard to get all of this from publishers, either due to paperwork not matching up or just not being available. And Claire Anker goes on to say, when we were working on website blocking last year, we needed a range of sample contracts to supply to the court as evidence. The quickest publisher responded to the request within hours as they had an in-house database, but the slowest took around six weeks as it involved searching through multiple filing cabinets across the globe, which of course means that infringing sites were accessible to consumers for six weeks longer than necessary. And she says there were also some rather lingering, lingering queries from our lawyers regarding the lack of documentation to prove the wholesale purchasing of backlists and acquisition of associated rights when a company has been taken over, which Natalie and mm. <laughs> I'll speak more to later. Uh, and Claire also notes that for digital formats, publishers seem to find it hard to work out what they hold the rights to and whether they're being infringed. She gives an example of audiobooks. Are the rights for abridged or unabridged? Um, do the rights cover streaming, downloads, or simply the right to produce digital editions of physical titles? Um, 
And I think she sums it up quite well by saying, if a publisher can't definitively tell me that they hold the rights to a work, I can't act on their behalf. So if you want to be able to defend your copyright, you must make sure your agreement's in good order and that there's a demonstrable chain of title and that you can locate and supply all the relevant paperwork quickly. So from talking about uh, trying to defend our content against um, privacy, we come on to risk four, which is infringement, and that's the risk that we might inadvertently infringe other people's rights. Publishers are extremely copyright compliant on the whole. We depend on it for the survival of our business, so it doesn't make sense for us to undermine it. But there are a few areas where balls get dropped, and it's here uh, that the risk lies. For example, authors not signing their agreements, but due to time pressures, material passes through into the production process, and no one quite remembers to follow up the missing agreement. Authors submit content for publication, but don't send in supporting paperwork to cover the use of third-party content, and no one follows it up. Authors submit agreements covering the use of third-party content, but no one checks that the terms and conditions uh, are, are able to be complied with by the business. Uh, authors use third-party material, but are not aware that they need to seek permission for its reuse, and no one spots it when the manuscript gets delivered. Um, and I want to just give you a great example of this from the rights management workshop that PLS held recently. Um, and in this case, a publisher thankfully had spotted that um, there was a photograph uh, in an article which had been taken on Mars. Uh, and when they spoke to the author about it, he was absolutely adamant that he did not need permission because he owned the copyright. <laughs> um, <laughs> So, <laughs> um, and as a result of these kinds of situations, publishers could inadvertently infringe other people's rights or at least compromise their ability to later defend their own rights. In the past, a third party whose content had been used without permission or had been used sort of in excess of the, of the limits of the permission would approach the publisher. There'd be a polite exchange of letters. Someone would pay some money. Um, there'd be an errata or an acknowledgement in the next reprint and, and everything was sorted out. But these days you might find that you're in receipt of a very different kind of letter. There are a growing number of organisations, particularly in the US, offering content owners no win, no fee deals to identify and seek compensation for un unauthorised use of their content. It's particularly um, an industry around images. Um, to give you an example, one such firm, the Picture Protection Service, boasts on its website that to date, copyright enforcement campaigns administered by Picture Protection Service have recovered over $5 million through over 500 settlements of infringement claims without a single jury trial, um, which works out as an average of $10,000 per settlement. So it's quite lucrative business to be in. Um, and the, there's a US-based online marketing company called The Content Factory, who unfortunately were on the receiving end uh, of one of these kinds of claims, and they've posted a warning to other bloggers uh, question, what's lamer than a crappy photo of Nebraska? Answer, having to pay $8,000 in copyright infringement penalties for it. This is a lesson we recently learned the hard way, and if you have or contribute to a blog, you might want to read about our story so you never ever make the same mistake we did. And they go on to say they believe photographers should be paid for the work, and they think that people who steal images deserve to pay some sort of restitution. Uh, and they pay for images every day. It was just an oversight in this particular case. Um, they said, but were we $8,000 worth of wrong? That works out to almost $100 per page view and comes nowhere close to any actual damages we might have inflicted on the photographer. So um, having hired their own lawyer, they were eventually able to um, settle the matter for $3,000. But nevertheless, it was an expensive rights management oversight. And even without a law firm, in the digital world, it's much easier to discover who's used your content. And this is an example um, closer to home. David Hoffman, who is a moderator for Editorial Photographers United Kingdom and Ireland, wrote in a blog post, in February last year, I spent a couple of evenings specifically looking for my pictures on the web. By the end of the year, those two evenings had led to me recovering more than £27,000 in fees due from seven major sites. So again, that's nearly £4,000 per site. And publishers at the moment are seen as rich pickings for these kinds of infringement actions. Several large textbook publishers have recently been dealing with infringement claims in respect of image use. 
In many cases, permission had been sought, but the publishers had exceeded the term of the agreement or the maximum circulation limit which was applied because they weren't managing the rights that they had acquired and ensuring that they remained compliant with them, with the terms of those agreements. In the US, damages awarded for those kinds of infringements can be huge, so publishers are faced with huge settlement bills trying to uh, avoid the risk of going to court where it could be very much worse. Um, and it's, so it's not really surprising that the large publishing houses are now really starting to take rights management seriously as an issue and investing heavily in systems and resources um, to put rights management uh, processes in place. Uh, and just um, to end this uh, risk, <laughs> another potential issue to be aware of is the need to be able to defend against claims of infringement. Simply misfiling an agreement may mean you lack the evidence required to rebut a claim of infringement. Um, so another uh, example here of a publisher who had published a medical photograph uh, and it was of a child's torso. So a claim was made against that publisher by someone saying that the photograph was of themselves as a child and stating that they'd never given their consent for the image to be used in that way. Fortunately, the publisher in question had the appropriate consent form uh, and was able to prove that not only did they have the uh, relevant rights, but that the claimant was not even the person in the photograph. Mm -hmm. um, but if they hadn't been able to locate that paperwork, they may have ended up paying a settlement or just taking their chances in court. So good rights management means you mitigate the risk of infringing copyright and dealing with costly legal bills. And I'll just quickly cover risk five, reputational damage. You can see how from the things we've talked about so far, that can have a, a real knock-on effect potentially on reputation. The quantity and complexity of our publishing agreements reduces the speed at which we can digitise content and repurpose it in innovative new ways. And this can leave the industry appearing to the outside world to be sluggish and slow to respond to market demands. Authors can be left frustrated by having to clear rights to use third-party content in their work and the inconsistencies between publishers over what rights are required and granted. We risk losing credibility in collective licensing ne negotiations and with, uh, anti with our anti-piracy initiatives because we aren't always able to supply the documentation to pro prove that we control the rights that we say we do. We risk our reputation with fellow creators, photographers, illustrators, cartographers, authors, bloggers, publishers, all of whose uh, rights we might infringe because we've not been diligent enough with our rights management practices. And these days, obviously, grievances are aired and shared instantaneously on social media, and it's easy to find yourself on the receiving end of social media shaming. So look after your rights and hopefully you protect your reputation as well. I'm going to hand over to Sarah now to cover our sixth risk. Yes, um, erosion of copyright. Do you want to come sit down? It is, is a concern. Um, as I've mentioned already, if you've got rights, you do need to look after them, um, you need to use them, you need to enforce them, actually. Um, if you're seen to be allowing people to ride roughshod over them, people will start to say, well, why, why should people have rights if they're not um, using them properly? Now, as a rights holder, you always have a discretion to decide whether or not you're going to allow someone to use your content and the terms on which you allow them to use it. And that, you know, no one can say because you say no on a certain occasion that you're not sort of using your rights properly. But, but equally, um, if you're not managing them very well or you're making it really difficult for, for not good reason for people to get a p permission from you, for example, if they, they want permission to, to reuse it in another publication and you take a long time to respond to them or make it very difficult for them, um, that, that all starts to build up a picture. It counts against you, really. And I think we have to just be aware that um, you know, legislators have been looking at how to handle the whole issue of out-of-commerce works because they suddenly seem to be out of reach. People want to use them but can't, can't reach them. We've got orphan works um, where they can't even trace the copyright owners and um, you know, perhaps not all those works are truly orphaned but it puts people to a lot of trouble trying to track you down to, to, to ask permission to use a work that appears to be an orphan work. 
And we have got increasing legislation building up around all of that. And um, we've also, um, we're very mindful that if we don't use copyright properly, uh, we are exposing ourselves to the risk of exceptions to copyright being introduced by legislators. So one of the shining examples of how you can really use your copyright well and um, through licensing is of course the uh, CLA licensing model in the education sector in particular. You know, we're really working the copyright and making it work for everyone. So um, right holders are getting paid for when their, their content's being used, but equally educators get access to the content they need. And it's a system that works really well. And licensing is, is often a very good answer. But um, if, you, if you don't make things available, you do run risks. And we don't want to play into the hands of, of those who would love to have more exceptions to copyright. We think we've got quite enough. Um, and I'm glad to say the European Commission, in their draft directive published two days ago, um, don't think we need that much more. They are introducing one new exception for text and data mining, but it's the same as one that we already have in the UK. So um, I'm glad to say that they're not pushing any further at this stage, but we, we have to be mindful of that in the way that we manage our copyrights and use them. So over to you, Natalie. Yes, would you, think, uh, yes, would you like to do that? Slightly longer. Yeah. Now, do I press this? Yes, did it right? <laughs> Hello, everyone. Um, so I'm going to talk for about 10, 15 minutes about um, the increased costs and risks uh, to mergers and acquisitions, M&A, uh, from uh, failure to, to, um, to, to follow good rights management processes. Um, just a weeny bit about uh, me to give you a flavour of, of the kinds of M&A work that I'm involved in. Um, my firm, Bertoni Mitchell, has been around since 94. We specialise entirely in publishing and information um, uh, businesses and examples of businesses that we've sold in the last um, 24 months uh, include Pion, sold to Sage, Rising Stars, an education business, sold to Hoda. Osborne, a professional business, sold to Kaplan. So that gives you a flavour of the kinds of sectors that we work in. But now, back, back to the topic at hand. Um, your contracts, yes, they can and they do affect uh, deal success. Any buyer is going to undertake a, a review of Target's contracts. In, in the old days, uh, we used to see contract reviews, which we organised in our offices, performed from filing cabinets. They were literally delivered by vans to our offices and people would come in and work their way through those filing cabinets. And they were generally in pretty bad shape. <laughs> Lots of contracts were missing. But frankly, it didn't matter too much unless you know, there, were really a very, there was really a very large number of material contracts that were missing. So that was 20 years ago. That has definitely changed, and it, and, it, and it really changed around 2007, 2008, uh, when the pressure for detailed review of contracts definitely increased, and the appetite for accepting lots of missing uh, contracts definitely decreased. So the contracts review outcome has, has definitely, these days, become one of the determinants of go or no go on an M&A transaction. And any contracts review is going to have to materially confirm for the buyer uh, in a go situation their assumptions, the ones that they built into their initial models, about synergies, durability of IP, exploitability of IP, extent of rights licensed or owned, costs for maintaining uh, and exploiting rights. I thought I'd devote a bit of time to, to, to a couple of case study examples which highlight um, what we've seen happen when rights aren't uh, necessarily optimally managed. So um, my first case study uh, to do with new edition rights. The situation was, was this. Seller owned a list of professional titles, including a major textbook. 
This was a small specialist list, and the number of potential buyers was, was pretty limited. The seller and uh, his preferred buyer had agreed terms. Valuation was very, very attractive. Issue, problem. Buyer's valuation hinged on leveraging the key textbook in that list and on a cycle of regular revision. The seller's copy of the textbook author contract um, is unsigned, was unsigned. And so the buyer requested a signed version before uh, closing the deal. The, the selling publisher had to contact the author. The author provided his own version. The new additions clause had been redacted. <laughs> Uh, uh, and at the same time, the author, who was getting pretty old, used the correspondence as an opportunity to say that he wasn't really up to doing a new edition any time soon. The problem here was that the author was, in this case, the absolute expert in the field, uh, and the result was that the buyer pulled out of the deal. Um, mm. That was worst case. <laughs> so, the, the worst case in, in 22 years of, of, of this business, from my point of view, I have to say. But anyway... Um, reflect, rectifying um, defective IP, putting contracts, licenses, permissions in place where they're missing uh, in the run-up to a deal is, is costly and risky, even applying, as any buyer or seller would, the 80-20 rule. Lawyers get really excited uh, and or motivated, motivated by a duty of care. They tend to advise towards more rather than less, more time spent agreeing what to do, more money spent on drafting, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, the, the other risk is that counterparties, e.g., authors, can see an opportunity, and that uh, can result in more money and uh, more time. And my next case study highlights that last point. So here, this is about editors who claim ownership rights. Situation was: seller owned a legal series, uh, which it had agreed to sell. The series was co-edited by a small, closely knit group of very eminent, eminent lawyers. The problem issue was that there was no um, express assignment of rights by the editors in their series contracts. Um, and as a result, uh, the editorial contracts needed the editor's consent to transfer. The seller hadn't really been a very active publishing partner, so it's, it's fair to say that the relationship with their editors was less than perfect. When the editors were contacted about the potential deal, uh, they claimed part ownership in the series. The result was that the editors got a slice of the deal, uh, and the seller's share of proceeds was actually quite substantially re reduced in, in that case. So, we then uh, have to ask, do you always need to tidy things up uh, before, you, before you embark on a deal? And, and in truth, the answer is no. Um, sometimes it's possible to undertake uh, the tidy up af after a deal is actually done. Uh, that can work and it can be preferable, but, it, but it's not risk-free. The risk is sometimes reputational, and Claire's already talked, uh, talked about that, reputation with authors uh, in particular in deal situations. Uh, the risk uh, nearly always also has a financial component. So it will be priced into the deal in some way unless the seller and the buyer have very, very specific reasons to be confident. So how, how does it get priced into the deal? It might be in the price up front, or it could be further down the line, depending on how the tidy up goes. So I thought um, I should then spend a little bit of time, if it's okay with you all, on, 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 on the shape uh, that deals can take, and, and, and basically any M&A deal will be either an equity um, or an assets uh, deal, but in, in either case, the documentation will always, in this industry, include publishing warranties, publishing contracts warranties. And um, wh what do I mean by that? Uh, I mean that, uh, this is slightly crude, but um, the buyer will get the benefit of warranties from the seller, a series of promises about the status of their contracts, which are backed up by a kind of money-back guarantee. So, so if the buyer has, uh, suffers a loss because um, a warranty that's been given by the seller is proved to be wrong, they can claim back 
some of the money that they paid for the asset in question. And in, in any publishing deal, there will be quite extensive publishing contracts warranties. They'll be at least one to two pages long, and they'll, they, they will uh, be warranties that, that give statements, promises about the state of the, the rights licensed, owned, used, exploitable. Buyers definitely rely on those warranties. I talked about the money back guarantee element, uh, but the fact is, today, uh, they, 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 they won't do a deal without them, full stop. <laughs> um, sellers uh, clearly want to maximise the value at exit, uh, and so they want to avoid any risk of claims. So, in short, that the, the whole warranties process, agreeing the shape of the warranties, an acceptable um, outcome for both parties, takes a lot of time in any M&A uh, deal situation and will take longer and cost more if your public publishing contracts aren't in a good state. <laughs> um, I think it's also worth going back to, to the shape of deals that you typically have in this industry, equity versus assets. Equity is when the whole business has bought the shares, so it's the, the chocolate box and, and the wrap, the, the, the the wrapping on the chocolates and the, ho the whole box. An asset deal is when you pick out certain chocolates, so you'll take the caramels, but you won't take something else, Turkish Delight or whatever. <laughs> um, but you know, as a seller, you will want to try to sell the Turkish Delight along with the caramels, because you probably want to clean up your operation um, for, for one reason or another. And you will be in a much, much better position as a seller to sell the whole lot if you can document the whole lot entirely accurately. And in any event, any asset sale and purchase agreement will, in an asset deal, include a schedule, which is called Schedule of Publishing Contracts. And it's literally a schedule of every single contract that is to be transferred. If you can't schedule, the rights that you own, you can't sell your assets. End of story. Um, in short, effective rights management is, is a key plank of, of, of mergers and acquisitions success. Let me leave you with um, one other sort of human uh, HR exemplification of this point. Most of the active um, acquirers have a business development team, M&A function, big, big uh, international publishing houses. Some acquirers have uh, a slightly smaller function, maybe, maybe slightly smaller businesses. Um, they, they traditionally put their publishers stroke divisional MDs in charge of the M&A function. One of the most successful in the last 10 years and active um, smaller publishers represented actually here <laughs> at this conference has their M&A function um, run by somebody whose um, business title is split between M&A and rights, exemplifying the importance mm -hmm. of this whole topic. Thank you very much indeed, Natalina. I think that's um, shown very poignantly why this is such an important area. So um, that, in summary, is the, the seven key commercial risks that we have identified. Um, can I ask you whether um, to share with us your experiences? I mean. Do, does this resonate with you? Do you have other areas that you've come across that could be problematic um, that we should be thinking about? Um, do you have any questions up to this point for the three of us before we come on to the solutions that Ian has asked for? Um, we're looking at the, the risks and the issues and the problems at the moment. I mean, is this familiar territory to people? Are there any questions? Sorry, it's for me again. <laughs> <laughs> 
There's a microphone coming your way fast. No, I'm not, not wishing to sort of, obviously you said that we might go on to this, but I, I just think it's worth recognising that the issues, well, the issues in, in general terms are the same for everybody. The solutions need to be different for smaller publishers and larger publishers because, you know, having seen an implementation of a digital asset management solution um, in a large organisation, I know that that's um, not a, um, a, a, a viable option or opportunity for smaller players. So I guess the challenge is to sort of um, have tools that, that work for smaller publishers and that awareness is really, is really raised within those organisations as well, which is why sessions like this are so important. Thanks, Ian. That's very helpful. Very helpful. Any other thoughts or comments at this point? Okay, well, then let's uh, move hastily on to um, what we might be able to do to, to, to avoid those problems. Um, I'm going to ask... <laughs> So, um, are we all, we'll all need to be on the mics now, thank you. <laughs> um, yes, so um, Claire, would you like to kick off with one of your solutions to this problem? Yeah, so the first solution I'd like to propose is um, to ask you all uh, to put, really put rights management at the heart of your business. Um, it needs to be, from the top down, there needs to be recognition that it is an essential part of what you're all doing. Um, I think that means that you need to be training staff to understand what rights management is, why it's important, and not just your editorial teams. Um, you need to put in place rights management policies um, that cover all of your creative outputs, um, and those policies should cover the minimum rights that you require to operate your business both now and in the future. Um, and it should also cover how those rights um, should be documented and recorded. Um, and it should consider what uh, exceptions you might be prepared to tolerate, if any, and, and how they're going to be authorised. Um, and also a sort of plea. Um, rights management often gets sidelined or dismissed in favour of um, sales targets or delivery targets. Um, and my view is, what's the point of, uh, of getting your content out there or, or making a bit of extra profit if you, know, you then end up having to pay all that out in a settlement or when you come to try and sell your assets, you have find you haven't actually got any to sell <laughs> because your paperwork's um, not up to scratch. Um, so the sort of risk of short-term inconvenience needs to be balanced with the risks associated with not actually having the appropriate rights. Um, and if there is a need to compromise your rights management policy, I think the judgment needs to be made by someone who can balance what's in the overall long-term best interests of the business, not someone whose target is going to be uh, impacted um, by the decision. So, uh, yeah, put it, put it at the heart of the of your business and, and make sure everyone understands why, what it is and why it's important. Natalina, would you want to add to that? Do you agree that it should be at the heart <laughs> of the business? I definitely agree that it should be at the heart of the business. Um, and it's not, actually, it's not just important in, in M&A situations. One of um, our clients um, may or may not be represented somewhere around <laughs> here. Um, put an enormous amount of investment and was very proud of its investment in, is that me? I think we're okay. Uh, in in um, a, a platform filled with um, uh, learning materials in its particular sector, resources of con bits of content, visual, written, all sorts of tools um, that it, it, it uh, put up uh, on its website, actually on a dedicated website. Uh, uh, and uh, made available uh, for free. Uh, and it had the usage, stats were fantastic, everybody was delighted with this thing. A couple of years later, commercial publishers, this was not a commercial publisher that did this, commercial publishers started to approach our client about 
potentially exploiting some of those assets in, in their own virtual learning environments. Um, and our client was very excited and thought, oh gosh, there's a commercial opportunity here potentially that, that um, won't tarnish our website, that can remain free, uh, but that w we can exploit this elsewhere. And, uh, and so started to engage in discussions and then actually engaged us to help them with those discussions and, and actually quite soon on we had to bring bring the thing to a close because we identified that the person who'd been charged with the project was not actually a publisher by background and had simply not um, uh, done what should have been done in terms of rights management. There was no record of where the content had come from um, to speak of and, and we started to build that record but found so many gaps that we had to close the project down. <laughs> right, so <laughs> at the beginning of a, any project, think yeah. about the rights. Yeah, okay. absolutely. Not absolutely. just um, when you're acquiring the rights, but at every stage along the line. Yeah. Um, so, um, moving on, is this a costly business? Should publishers invest? <laughs> what would you? <laughs> well, it is, but it's it's alluded to yeah, problem. and, it, and it's, it is a particular challenge. Obviously, the smaller the publisher, hopefully, the smaller the list. So, therefore, it should be proportionately the same for in terms of how you manage your rights, whether you're large or small. Um, but agree that digital asset management systems, um, which don't even have rights management associated with them anyway, uh, it are not the solution for everyone. Um, so, but I, it is important to, that we've seen what the costs might be, the opportunity costs, the, the you know, costs of the valuation of your business, the costs um, of potential claims. Um, so, so I think, you know, we don't really have a choice as an industry, we've got to invest something in it. And res just simply resourcing your rights management processes. In a small publisher, you're not going to have someone who's um, got a whole job or a department dedicated to rights management but if you can make it part of somebody's job description to be the rights management person to have a sort of oversight of all the content in the organization and how that's being managed I think that's a that's a good start so um, quite often rights are fairly low down on the scale of important issues to be addressed how how might we impress upon publishers the importance of putting sufficient resources towards this. Do you have any, <laughs> <laughs> any thoughts? I mean, besides scaring them with big numbers of, <laughs> <laughs> of money that it might cost for getting it wrong. Um, yeah. Not <laughs> Put Natalina in front of them. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Well, there is um, obviously a lot to be done there, but... Um, as Ian says, I mean, smaller publishers have different capabilities and resources, but but you can do a lot without um, simple advanced system. systems. Yeah, it doesn't. Simple system. Yeah, it doesn't yeah. take. It doesn't take like some really quick and easy basic things are when you've got rights agreements. Don't let um, editorial assistants who leave every six months have those stored in their personal e email files. You know, we see that all the time. You know, make sure that you've got a centralised filing place. And then having got a centralised filing place, make sure you have a really good naming convention. We're actually working on a project right now which involves um, us supervising teams of students to, p to do a massive rights management project for a client. And um, one of the things they're doing is renaming files because all the files are stored in editorial drives who each file them in a different way. <laughs> um, some of them file them by publication date, some by author, and they've all got completely different um, file names so you don't know what is um, an advance notice versus what is a, a permission versus what's a, a head final head contract. So like some really basic things like that, mm. even if you're going to do it all on paper, put it in one filing cabinet, <laughs> filed the right way. Um, if you're going to do it digitally, which would obviously be preferable, you know, it's, it's just a case of being thorough and being consistent and you will make your lives a whole lot easier having those policies that say, you know, we must have for every item that we publish an um, agreement that says what rights we've got and making sure you've got someone within your organisation who's going to actually take responsibility for that 
and then checking that that's happening. We always um, say that there's a sort of collective memory in an organisation of about three months. So if you told somebody to do something three months ago, you, it's probably time to tell them again. So you need to have um, you need to have in place sort of somebody who's going to, you know, check up, you know, audit your systems and make sure that your um, that that the rights management practices that you have put in place are being adhered to and managed regularly. Hmm. Some very practical tips there. Thanks, Claire. <laughs> <laughs> but lots of our publishing, smaller publishing clients, don't ha don't even have their contracts digitised, and that, that's absolutely fine mm. as long as they're well ordered, well ordered, and there is some sort of systematic overview. Then it, they appoint people like us. We come in and then we digitise for the purposes of doing a deal. But that's actually really quite an easy process. Yeah, that's, that's not yeah. hard, is it? No. Mm. The hard bit is just making sure they're all there. Yeah. <laughs> in one place. In together. one place, yeah. 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 Not flying around the place. Yeah. yeah. <coughs> so it doesn't have to be expensive investment in systems, just in people doing the yeah, right things, yeah, just simple procedures and processes. Absolutely. Right, great. Um, what about the rights that you're acquiring? Do you have practical tips around that? <laughs> yeah, I think it's really, it, it, I'm really surprised by how often um, publishers uh, have all these grand digital plans and they, as I said in the talk earlier, and they work hard on making sure they get the right kind, you know, all the right rights in their editorial agreements. But then something like um, a table in a, in a textbook might have a limited permissions term on it. And then your whole book is scuppered. Mm. And that just seems, you know, you've got whatever your rights policy is, it's got to apply to all your content. Otherwise, you're always going to have one thing that trips you up. Mm. Um, so, uh, and sort of thinks deciding up front what your rights acquisition policy is going to be um, and that needs to be consistent with the market and the rights that you're likely to be able to acquire in the market it's you know Pearson will every day of the week say they want all rights forever and everything <laughs> uh, and they can ask for that but they rarely get it so um, that's the other point is that you know what you ask for and what you get might be two different things and again in terms of your rights management um, processes you need to be able to um, go through that full loop. So if you ask for something and don't get it, you don't assume that you got what you asked for. You actually decide, do we need to go back and renegotiate and get those additional rights? Do we uh, remove the content? Um, because going ahead without those rights is going to trip you up down the line. And, and, and not knowing whatever the limitations are is going to trip you up if you're a buyer or a seller in an M&A situation, for sure, because those publishing warranties will cover every bit of content, including those tables. <laughs> <laughs> so in addition to every bit of content, um, you should presumably also be thinking about how you're going to use that content going forward. It might not just be a sort of one-off use. You might want to reuse it in a number of different ways. Yeah, So absolutely. how do you legislate for that? Yeah, it was really hard. I mean, that's why that's where the I shouldn't shouldn't um, just lay, lay it all on Pearson, but that's <laughs> big publishers have that approach of just kind of go in and try mm. and do a big land grab. Uh, and there's all sorts of um, terms now floating around for kind of um, sort of additional rights and, and repurposing rights and, and all this kind of thing. Um, so you can try and do that, or you just say, what is my likely, you know, for the next five to 10 years, what do I need? And am I prepared to, in five or 10 years time, once I need to renegotiate those rights, am I prepared to commit time and resource to doing that at that point in the future? Because you've got to weigh, the more rights you ask for, the higher the cost is going to be. So you've always got mm. to weigh up, um, you know, future proofing against what the budget realistically allows for. Um, but it's difficult because we want to have rights in perpetuity and be able to sell our backlists forever and a day. <laughs> um, but. But, but most rights holders won't give you those rights, and if they do, they'll give them to you at a very high price. So there's always a bit of, um, you know, a bit of a, a weighing up of, of where the appropriate mm. um, level is. And Natalina, do you ever come across a situation where um, rights may have been granted to the publisher, but um, without 
permission to sell on or you know is that ever a block to any of your acquisitions definitely it's a good question actually Sarah so in that in I talked about two types of deals equity versus assets um, th there are plenty of situations where actually buyers will now today increasingly decide that they're actually going to buy the equity even though on the face of it that might look like a more expensive deal because you need more lawyers more accountants mm -hmm. all the rest of it but buy the equity because as a general rule everything comes across you buy the shares you buy, you buy I said the, the box of chocolates the wrapping of the box you buy the whole lot and you get the contracts if you buy assets on the other hand um, it, it, it can be the case that unless there are express assignment mm. rights, you, you can't transfer those contracts without permission from the original rights holder. So that can be a really involved mm. process. Right, so go for the full, fully wrapped box of chocolates. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you negotiate your rights, um, you think you've got what you want, have you actually got what you want? Do you <laughs> <laughs> need to, um, how do you know what you've got? Do you need to yeah. record it? Yeah, absolutely. So um, recording, th the best thing to do, we've talked a, a bit about storing documents um, and Ian mentioned rights, or oh, mentioned asset management systems, which obviously are a way of managing your assets. Um, there are starting to be now big commercial operators that will provide software to do this, but, but it's kind of early days. But what we really need is information about the rights that we have, because until we can get to a position where we're all storing metadata about our content assets, um, yes, we're going to be able to find our agreements in filing cabinets or on centralised filing systems quite easily, but that's still going to take a relatively long time. And for particular um, sales opportunities, you might just need to know, can I do this thing? Can I do that thing? And it will be different in each opportunity. And without uh, rights metadata, you'd have to go back and, and reference each particular contract to see if it had the relevant clauses that you needed in it. Uh, and I've had to do that many times, and it's really frustrating. So when you're in that position, you quickly um, work out how to log metadata about those rights so that next time somebody asks, you can just um, run a you know run a filter on an excel spreadsheet at its most basic and be able to tell people what rights you have so i think recording information about the rights you have you know what kinds of digital formats can we use are we allowed to enable people to slice and dice this content um are there any third party restrictions we need to be aware of it doesn't have to be massively detailed just a few clues um, that are going to help you when a sales opportunity comes along to identify which content can be in it and which content you'd have to take out of it um, or at least do some further work on. Um, so again, that's a, another thing where you're weighing up um, you know, to put in place an all-singing, all-dancing digital asset management system with full rights metadata. It's probably not worth it for most people. <laughs> it's just a massive investment. Um, but so, so you need to just think about what's the minimum that you can do to help yourself and make sure that you're not missing out on those opportunities. And if you've got a relatively small list, you can do it on Excel. Um, if you've got a more complex list, you know, it wouldn't take much to get someone to put an access database for you, set together for you, or sort of develop whatever um, publishing management systems you're using, um, or article um, systems to, um, to just kind of capture a few extra fields of data about rights management. Yeah, once you've done that, then when you get into an M&A situation, you know, life is an awful lot easier for those publishing warranties that you're going to have to give, where you're going to have to set out, yeah, um, the nature of your of your rights, which won't be all singing, all dancing, unless you're Kirsten. <laughs> <laughs> but but before you get to the point of storing, you you do need to um, document the deal that you've agreed with the content supplier so yeah. you know whether it's an author or a photographer or whatever we you gave the example where the author just hadn't signed the contract yeah. so it was worthless and mm. so what would do you have something to add to that <laughs> more <laughs> advice <laughs> well just the, the thing I said earlier about really making sure that you um, yeah whatever agreements you sign up to you've got to be able to comply with the terms and conditions so if somebody wants you to be 
accounting annually for something or you know or informing them about sales numbers annually can you do that if you can't do that don't accept the terms of the agreement find something else or you know um, leave it out so you've got to you've got to look at your agreements very carefully and you've got to record information that will enable you to comply with them so if there is a any kind of um, term limit so it's good the agreement is only going to last for five years for ten years then you've got to have somewhere to log that and you've got to have a system that is going to alert you when that um, period comes to an end so that you can renegotiate now that might be a case of somebody having a five-year planner on a wall <laughs> and and putting notes on it you know there are always low-tech ways of solving these issues and, and and what you need will depend on the the complexity of your list and the amount of these kinds of agreements that you're grappling with yeah. But I, I, yeah, sorry. I was just going to say, don't risk publishing and anything until you know that you've secured the rights and you have got them recorded in a contract. I mean, it's just mm. you must have either a, a license to publish or an assignment of copyright or a license to do whatever it is that you're seeking to do used on a website. Um, don't rely on a, sh a handshake. It's far too risky. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and if you're a society, don't rely on a publishing partnership agreement which has been in place for 30 years because it won't be fit for purpose and you might well find yourself, as we've seen, actually in a number of, exa of examples over the last five years, with, with rights actually migrating um, in the wrong direction so far as you society are concerned. <laughs> <laughs> I always find, yeah, I, I mean, as Sarah said, it's just sort of a practical way of managing what Sarah said, ma making sure you've got agreements for everything. Literally for each piece of content, you should have some kind of documentation. That might be an author agreement, it might be a permissions agreement, it might be a printout of some terms and conditions from a website, or it might be a note that says, this content is out of copyright, so I don't need to have anything. <laughs> but at least you have documented that fact you might know that but the next person to do your job or someone else who's looking at the system won't know they'll just see a gap and they won't know that it's out of copyright and the author died whenever and you've got all this sort of paper trail to prove it yeah. you need to put a bit of resource into reversions as well don't oh you? When yes they, um, when they keep happen yes <laughs> <laughs> absolutely keep reversions is always really complicated so many people deal with their reversions if you want to just explain yeah, what, sorry, what a reversion are. So a reversion is when um, either a publisher decides, perhaps because they've put a book out of print, or um, a creator requests that the rights that they granted are reverted back to them. Um, so uh, different publishers have different policies about when and how they revert rights. But often the people managing rights reversion sit somewhere else from the people who are doing the rights acquisition. And even if they are in the same place, they don't necessarily think of reversions as needing a, the same sort of paper trail or structure. But of course, they are a, um, a, an amendment to the publishing agreement, effectively, and they need to be held together and recorded. The amount of um, issues I've seen with backlist digitization projects where nobody thought to check reversion records, um, <laughs> because actually what they find, the size of the archive they thought they had is, is much diminished. <laughs> When, when they see actually how many of those rights ha have gone back to the um, original creators. So yes, reversions are really important. Yeah. But we, I mean, the reversions are always a question in a buyer's questionnaire. You know, what's your process for them and how many have there been? Yeah. And can we have a schedule? Also, so lots, mm. of, lots of experience of sloppily worded reversion mm. documents where people say we are reverting the rights or the, right, the rights in this uh, book and give it an ISPN but not the EISPN and you know so which rights are, are there you know has anyone been specific about formats or territories or whatever so worth again tie that all up in your rights management policy have standardized wordings and templates for that kind of thing so that brings us on to how you manage compliance with your contractual obligations and your your contracts that you have agreed um, We've touched on it, but yeah, just just to say that you've got to just be really, um, really clear about um, what restrictions you might have over any content, and and uh, say how you uh, make sure you can comply with those. If it's too difficult to comply with those kinds of restrictions, it's just not viable for your business to do that. 
then you can't accept those terms in the first place. You have to use some other content. Um, I think that's really important. Only accept terms if you can comply with them and put in place processes to make sure that you've got budget um, to pay for reclearances if you need to and resource to manage a reclearance programme if that's what you need to do. Yeah, and don't always assume that a, the draft contract that you're um, considering um, is, um, is acceptable just because it's been sort of put in front of you. You may think that you know what rights it's describing, um, what the rights it's describing are, but um, be absolutely certain of that. Because the amount of ambiguity that can mm. uh, go into contracts is quite, quite extraordinary. <laughs> So are you suggesting they should get external advice? Sometimes, if I mean, it depends on the nature of the project, of course. Yes. Yeah. There's that ROI question. But yes, I mean, ambiguity shouldn't be in any contract. Mm. And even a simple contract, um, you know, an editor should be able to spot that and should not be frightened mm. of just going back and saying, I don't understand this clause. Mm. It's a perfectly reasonable question to ask. And it's not a difficult one to ask. People don't like to rock the boat, but mm. sometimes it's... it's yeah, and yeah. I think that, that raises a point where often rights acquisition is delegated to the most junior staff in a, an organisation. It's really often editorial assistants with a month or two's of worth of experience having to grapple with this. They don't understand the terms that they're getting. They don't know whether they're acceptable, but they're under pressure to get them in and so that the projects can go back out to production. And um, you know they're sort of busy turning the sausages through the sausage factory, and yeah. <laughs> and no one's taking notice of what these terms and conditions are. So it needs to be really built into training programs and sort of awareness. And going back to really put it, putting, making sure everybody in the organisation knows about rights management. So that I guess brings us on to what PLS can do to help, because we are very exercised about this whole area and we, we do perceive there is a, a demand and a need for more, more support and Ian's touched on it. So we've been looking at um, all sorts of possibilities. I mean we've already started uh, with our permissions service which is building up and we're in fact a number of publishers are outsourcing their permissions clearance to us and we're, we're making use of our PLS Clear tool, which is currently being developed into its third phase, which will allow paid for licensing. At the moment it allows for free of charge licenses. But we're looking at the wider picture as well. So um, we've been offering, um, running workshops, which Claire has been running for us around permissions management. Um, and we're, we're going to broaden those out into rights management workshops, which um, we're hoping to, to kick off with very shortly. Yeah, the first date's 10th of October, if you know anyone who wants some practical rights management to train. <laughs> <laughs> so do, do look out, um, you know, we, Joe, who's in the audience, <laughs> our comms manager, sends out regular e-bulletins and uh, flags up all these sort of opportunities for you. They're all... Um, all the details will be there um, and we're going to start to do more webinars but we're, we're also going to try and develop some um, best practice guidelines and um, you know that will involve looking at uh, best practice in, in contracts as well um, we're working a number of trade associations do already recommend pro forma contracts. Um, there is Clark's precedence, but I think it would be helpful if PLS was sort of to draw the threads together and point people in the right direction or even offer pro forma contracts where they're not otherwise available. So that's another area that we're, we're looking to develop at the moment. Um, we're looking at the whole business of, of developing standards, metadata standards. That's, that's terribly important to help you manage your rights. Um, we will be moving on to webinars. We're doing more and more webinars on other areas, but this is something that we want to focus on as well. So um, those are the thoughts that we've had so far. We're, we are developing a, a much bigger plan for rights management support at the moment. So do, do look out for, 
for what we tell you in our, in our e-bulletins. But equally, we've got you all here. You've heard Claire and Natalina. It'd be really interesting to know if you feel we've missed anything or if there's anything further you would like from PLS by way of support because um, you know we're, we're here for you, the publishers, to, to try and give you whatever support we can. So if there are any further ideas, we'd really welcome hearing from you either now or you know later on in the over drinks or by email. Um, Jeremy Brinton, our head of publisher relations, is there and will um, welcome all suggestions that come his way. Nothing popping up at the moment. Oh, sorry, oh yes, some <laughs> hands going up. <laughs> <laughs> okay. We'll start with Ian, and then we've got a couple more. Start at the front. Okay. <laughs> Can you reach across? Sorry. I have quite a loud voice in any case. <laughs> <laughs> Could you um, introduce yourself and tell us where you're from? Certainly. I'm Chris Burton Brown from My Law Financial Management. I'm a uh, finance director, and I have a number of publishing company clients. Uh, so one of my clients. Um, has uh, just identified that one of their books is available online, completely unauthorized. Um, and we've sent a takedown notice. Uh, and really, I suppose that the question is how, uh, we, we were lucky, one of our customers spotted it and came to us to tell us which so we didn't know anything about it, but w how could we more proactively be tracking these sorts of things? Is is it a service <laughs> that anyone in particular offers? Yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to say? Well, it's down to the infringement portal, I yeah. think, the PA infringement portal. So yeah. do you want to Do go ahead? Yeah. Do you, I don't know if you've uh, the Publishers Association run a tool called the Copyright Infringement Portal. Um, which I think ALPS members have access to. And all PLS signed publishers have access to that th with a discounted rate. You know, we, we um, can send you more details about that. But, but, but they so that's a sort of pr a system that proactively, um, by the use of um, magic, uh, goes out and, uh, and robots and, and uh, crawls lots of um, sites, monitors big um, known infringement sites and automates the issuing of notice and takedown sites. And then um, beyond that, where they see larger scale infringements, then the PA is sort of actively pursuing um, infringement action on behalf of publishers. But we have recently launched this service, and um, we've actually got a webinar coming up on Oh, it was yesterday. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> but it will be on our website. <laughs> Yes, so it will. You'll find the the webinar on, on the website in the next couple of days, and you might like to start by looking at that and seeing how you can get involved. Right. Thank you. There was another hand there. Yes, at the back. Oh, can we have the microphone back? <laughs> <laughs> um, hi, Paul Deere, the IET here. Um, maybe just a, an idea or a suggestion. Um, permissions, obviously, the bane of the life of every editor who's working on an editor's book. Could you just speak into the microphone a bit? Yeah, can you hear me better? Yes, there? we yeah. can, thanks. Uh, permissions for books and edited books in particular. Um, in the STM field, you have the STM permissions guidelines, guidelines. where a, a bunch of publishers have come together and said, if you're part of this club, then we will clear the permissions between ourselves for free. Um, but something maybe the PLS could do is to look at that as a model and expand that out to other publishers in other sectors um, uh, beyond. They're not very good at the biological stuff at the moment. It's mostly engineering and uh, the physical sciences. So maybe that's an area you could look at. So is it is it is the problem the cost or the getting the permission? Or you still have to request. For some of, for some of them, you yes. don't even have to request as part of the agreement. But uh, the others you do. But it will be for free. So right. therefore, you can say to your authors, um, you still have to get these permissions, but you can do it for free. Don't worry about it. 
uh, which makes it a lot easier. I think the STM community uh, were able to come up with that uh, with those agreements because um, <coughs> essentially they're all borrowing each other's content. Um, it's quite hard to broaden that up to other parts of publishing beyond the academic sector because for trade publishers, for example, or um, you know, authors' agents, um, the same sort of quid pro quo is not in operation. So I think that's one particular issue. Um, then I guess there is potentially scope for looking at um, academic publishers who might not fall within the STM field, um, sort of humanities and social sciences and, and okay, other areas. Just a bit of a follow-up question on that. Um, you never get all permissions cleared. There's usually 5, 10, 20% that you haven't done. And most publishers seem to kind of let that go because they can't think of any instances where one publisher has sued another one for uh, this kind of infringement. Not, not so far, but look at what's happening with the images that I spoke about earlier where somebody in two days can make £24,000 in um, getting infringement settlements. So I think you'll find that the tide is starting to turn. There aren't many big publishers now who are going to uh, be accepting uh, going to press without having all singing on all dancing permissions agreements. So whilst that absolutely, I agree with you, that was the case in the past, I would be saying to you, I would be cautious about doing that going forward. Okay, thanks. But it might still be worth um, our exploring this with both STM and ALPSP because there might be something that can be done yeah, there are, I know, mean within a, a closed community. That a STM have obviously got around it, but there are obviously also anti-competitiveness issues to be mindful yes. of as well. Yeah, absolutely. But but by doing it through a body like PLS, you can yeah. overcome some of that. Hello, it's Suzanne from ALPSP. I just thought it's now a good time to mention the special offer for Alps conference attendees, or is that no? Um, I think it's about the, it's more about the permissions work that's the next week. Uh, oh, yes. Yeah, yeah I just, I just the PLS are very kindly as Gold Plus sponsor. They're offering four places at 50% off for their workshop on straightforward permissions next week. So just if anyone here in the room is interested, the first of all people to give their card to Sarah or Jeremy <laughs> gets the deal. <laughs> so I just wanted to thank PLS for that kind offer as well, because I yeah. think it plays to what you were saying, Claire, about the importance of training, just generally around rights and permissions and licensing. And then we've got a question at the back. Been waiting patiently. It's you. Uh, I, I'm Ian Russell from Bioscientifica. Um, so I just perhaps we could return to where we started and talking about the the rights valuation. Yes. And you know, if you could say in one te one sentence or a couple of sentences what it is that publishers need to do to have a more beneficial outcome there, is it? I mean, what what, what I'm not myself clear exactly what was examined as part of that um, valuation exercise. <laughs> is it easy to say? Um, it the the nub of it, it turned on um, a random selection of publishers you know, across the board um, being able to produce the documentation to show that they did have the rights to um, license for secondary use, for example, so that they did have adequate rights, had acquired the rights from their authors in particular. Um, that's where we, we fell down, but also in the case of images. Um, so, you know, there were cases where either the publisher couldn't find the document or um, you know, it hadn't been signed or, I mean, Claire, you were intimately involved yeah, in the process as harassing well. harassing publishers, trying to get them to, <laughs> to locate agreements. Lots, you know, the stuff that was just, because of the way that the sample was done on, on sort of, copying that had taken place some of the things that had been copied were really old and publishers just couldn't find um documentation that went back as far as it needed to to cover it some people couldn't even tell that it was something they'd ever published so <laughs> it, but it, so it was basically putting your hands on the evidence rather yeah. than the framing of the agreements or things being missed from the agreements. yes yeah yes it was the hard evidence that valuation thing we were saying that 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 revenue stream in the PL 
use that factor of eight. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, the factor might not be quite so high in a sort of in, a, in an M&A situation, but nevertheless, that income is very valuable. Okay. Yeah. And it's more valuable than other kinds of income. I'm not saying it's d at the top of the pyramid, but it's pretty high up or can be. That's very interesting. Mm. Right. Well, I think um, we've probably done enough on that for today, given you enough to think about. So we'll bring the, the session to a close. I'd like to thank Claire and Natalina for their incredible insight and generosity in, in sharing all that they've shared with us today. Thank you both very much indeed. And